Welcome to Abbott's Third Town Hall on COVID-19. My name is Billy Zydek, Standards and Codes Administrator for APA. Just a couple of housekeeping items before we get started. The webinar recording will be posted to the APA webpage later this afternoon. You'll receive a follow-up email in a couple of days with a link to the web page where all webinar recordings are housed, as well as links to our upcoming webinars and town halls. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Please type your questions in the chat box and they will be answered in the order they are received. If we run out of time and we still have questions, responses will be sent directly to persons asking the question by one of our presenters. Professional continuing education, ISDs, and AIA CLUs are being offered. For AIA certificates, please send an email to Billy, B-I-L-L-I-E, at APA.org with your membership number. If you did not indicate you wanted a certificate at registration, just send me an email. At this time, it's my pleasure to turn this over to Lander, your moderator for today. Lander, take it away. Thanks everyone for joining us. I want to let you know that we're pretty close uh, to capacity um, with over a thousand uh, people on this call. We appreciate all of you. Uh, joining us and being part of the dialogue. Uh, we've had two town halls to date. There are Q&As that have come off those that are now in our and on our website, COVID-19 Resource Center page. Uh, there are a lot of resources there. People are responding. Uh, we are really appreciative of what everybody is doing to pull together as an APA community because that's just what you do. So thank you today for joining the dialogue and you can do that through uh, the chat box and asking questions um, uh, or in the questions box. So let us know. Um, we do have AI credits, which I'm really excited about. Uh, Billy was able to pull that off and that's really great. So there, we're gonna talk about um, and focus on interpreting essential construction services during COVID-19. Precautions, challenges, and emerging practices. We have extensive questions over the past two weeks around the provision of construction and, and renovation projects or not. There are new stay-at-home orders in all but 10 states as of yesterday. What the states and the feds are saying about essential services, let alone the institutions we want to address. Uh, the plethora of challenges in trying to manage projects as we're moving forward amidst all this chaos. Plus, we have responses from two surveys, uh, Joint Construction Owners Alliance and APA's FM Services in Construction. And then um, there's a, a reminder for me about the word emerging practices. Please understand, it's all emerging. We are all rookies at this, given all the uncertainty and the uncharted territory. So please understand that. Our panelists, which you will see on this slide, are going to help us think about all of this. Uh, we are so blessed to have these three individuals as they each teach for APA-U, um, the Institute of Facilities Management Program, and or have written chapters for APA's body of knowledge. I mean, that's fantastic, right? What a great uh, group of colleagues. So the format's gonna be this. There's a brief intro um, to set the context. I'm gonna highlight two surveys, results and responses, Give, cite some relevant news sources. Um, I'll open up for panelists to speak to us with some opening remarks. And then we'll do some Q&A and a lot of Q&A because I know you have questions and we wanna to get to as many of them as possible. Um, and then we'll conclude with an available resources slide and some closing remarks in the following uh, Friday's town hall uh, that we're going to address. So let's go to, uh, Billy, that uh, slide of where we are. Whoa, I take a deep breath because I've been contrasting every town hall, the coronavirus stats for the United States globally and, um, and, and the number of deaths. And I am sad, very sad to say that uh, we had tracked last week, 326, last Thursday night, 85,500 cases and 1,300 deaths. As of today, the U.S. alone has 242,182 cases and 5,850 deaths. 
Let's go to the next slide. This should reinforce and reemphasize the importance of exponential change, which I've used the lily pad to help you understand how fast this is moving. Exponential thinking is the way in which we must address this. And change management is no longer in days, it's in hours. It's an instantaneous movement. And so we have to be able to, and I am convinced that facilities professionals can do this, uh, react, respond, adapt, and readapt um, as, as things continue. Um, I want to stress again the importance of social and physical distancing, and you can see that on the next slide um, regarding the job site. Yeah, we, we're, our panelists are going to talk about what they're doing in this regard, but that is the single most important thing that all of us can do. We may not be able to control everything around us, but I'm telling you, the social physical distancing is making a difference. And if you're in the state of Washington where this birth, the first case emerged, they in, 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 um, set up restrictions immediately. They really got on top of this and they are seeing at least glimmers of hope that that's helping to turn around um, what is happening in their state. So this is, this is good. Okay, so I wanna go to some of the survey results and I wanna look at the slide that gives you an angle of vision on construction um, and what we've do done with this joint um, construction owner survey. Over 250 responses, by the way. Uh, and that was uh, a big old thank you to COA, Construction Owners Association of America. They had a town hall last, uh, this past Tuesday. Uh, the Association of uh, General Contractors, SAME, Military Engineers, and a few others for their collective effort on this joint survey. Over 250 responses from just construction owners. And then I'm also going to give you on this same slide some of APA's own FM facility management services and construction survey um, responses. We garnered over 700 responses before we had to close down yesterday morning. So you can see in this infographic, which frankly I absolutely love it, it gives you a, a quick visualization of what is happening as we roll up both sets of survey results using this infographic. And here's what we found, you can see it. Um, projects being halted or delayed within the last 30 days are 50-50. Those that delayed more than 30 days actually is a 65-35 no, which is very interesting. You can then see in the middle when we look at why are the project, you know, the project being delayed and what disruptions are occurring. And you can see in those four areas, almost equally distributed between material shortages, including PPE and other items that you've been hearing about in the medical community, shortage of trade and craft workers, uh, government workers to do inspections and permitting, and then the evidence of infected individuals. You can see across that easily what's happening in terms of the delays and disruptions. And then are projects still considered essential? Well, we've got a third, a two thirds saying yes and a third saying no. We're gonna hear more about that today. Uh, continuing projects, some, a quarter are saying no and three quarters are saying that they are yes. And contractors working on their campuses, three quarters are saying yes and a quarter are saying no. And then material availability, wow, that's back to the joint uh, uh, construction survey from the middle. Indeed, we're finding that. And if I looked at the data two days ago, I would have had more no's. And as we continue to go into this, I think you're going to hear from our panel about that, that it's getting worse. So we had a number of questions from people just in the last two days about the results of that survey. And they wanted to get a few answers. And so I did want to say that screening your staff, what we're finding is they're doing temperature checks, questionnaires, and self-monitoring and screening for symptoms. All of this, you can go to our COVID-19 campus procedure. You are going to see not only the answers to these questions in summary form, but you're going to see everything that your colleagues graciously gave to you. I'm telling you, this is definitely worth the read because they have given you an incredible amount of information. Are they staggering shifts? Yes, split, cr scr uh, split crews, skeleton crews, reduced hours, staggered shifts, alternating staff on different days, one day on, one day off. So you can see all the different ways they're doing it. 
supply shortages. It's all the stuff that medical staff are also screaming about, that we're hearing about in the news. Um, and it's things like fogging machines, electrostatic sprayers, paper goods, that kind of, and in particular, a variety of construction related materials. Mental health issues. You might think I have a mental health issue on a daily basis, but I'm telling you, it's important. I just only to try to lighten things up from time to time, but our folks say that indeed um, they're dealing with uh, mental health issues. Their primary response was the University Employee Assistance Programs, the EAPs that you have in place, which provide a network of services. And then secondarily, they said, whatever you do, communicate, communicate, communicate. It's critical. And there are additional services, free counseling, telehealth, teledoc services, all those things. And then the final question that I want to highlight for you is that are you managing outside um, contractors and what are the precautions that you are taking? In doing so, you are using CDC and OSHA guidelines and regulations. In particular, state and local provincial guidelines are being followed, which we have advised. Um, you're either mitigating this through your own safety protocols, reviewing your contractors, or you're actually having contractors develop their plans, manage their own crews, but you're checking in on them. So you wanna pay attention to the risk mitigation practices that are identified on the website and what our panelists have to say today. Okay, let, those are a summary of the results and we appreciate everyone, over a thousand people giving us responses. So I wanna highlight a couple of news sources. You've seen CISA, let's go to that next slide. And we've got the um, HTTP link here. CISA is the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security um, Agency of the federal government. And what I wanna highlight is very brief. They have been driving this, uh, this deal behind um, infrastructure being considered an essential service. But they say in all caps coming from the director, this is, this is advisory in nature. It is not, nor should it be considered a federal directive or standard. Now I say that on purpose because it does refer to individual jurisdictions and how you want to handle it. And that's what we're seeing across the board. Um, the Washington Post, let's go to the next slide. I can show you that source from just March 28th this week. Um, it was work on regions, big projects continues amid coronavirus. It is confusing people, but it is considered an essential business and each one of your uh, governors are making decisions about that and indeed your institutions. So I wanna go to that. I wanna let you know that the University um, of, uh, or Michigan State University made a conscious decision to stop um, construction and renovation projects. They felt it was for the greater good and in alignment with the governor of the state of Michigan's uh, stay at home order. That's one, the campus and the way they're dealing with it. University of Minnesota went a different direction as a number of panelists have done. They said that university operations and exceptions for central on-campus plans are reflected in the 16 critical infrastructure workers categorized by the Department of Homeland Security. So if you thought it was an easy answer, it's not. It is absolutely all over the map. You have to make your decisions and gain your own guidance in this regard. So I wanna to transition to the panel now. So let's, we're gonna to move to Jeff G. And I want to frankly tell the panel that um, someone told me recently, the earth has moved under our feet. How are you seeing it move under your feet with respect to construction? Now I said at the opening as teachers and writers for APA's programs, institute and body of knowledge, each of you comes with a broader understanding, a lay of the land with respect to this topic than most um, have. So we are blessed to have you. So I for one am really looking forward to your perspectives and different vantage points. So let's get started. Jeff G, I'm gonna, point to you and I'm gonna ask you as Vice President, Swinerton Management and Consulting. Jeff is gonna provide us an overview of where we are first in California and then across the country. Given his role as the Vice President of Swinerton, Jeff's going to talk with us about projects, precautions, emerging practices and pinch points moving forward. Jeff, let's roll. 
Thank you, Lander. And Lander, thank you and the APA team for doing this um, and all the members that are on um, the call or the webinar because this is really helpful for all of us. As you said in your earlier comments, this is changing constantly. And um, in my opening comments, it'll reflect some of that. So let me back up and give you a big picture first, and then we'll bring it down to a, a more detail. I'm very honored to be part of the Swinner 10 family companies. We are a coast to coast national construction service company, 19 office locations and over 5,000 employees. One of our largest markets is construction. We do renewable energy and I lead the program and construction management um, division here at Swinner 10. Um, so it's, it's really a great opportunity to bring a lot of different perspectives from around the country uh, to this conversation. As you indicated, we're in a public health emergency. And the hard part about this, when we look at across the country, is there's a huge variety of approaches and orders in place right now, from a complete shelter in place to essential services and then different definitions of essential services. Uh, while I'm based in California and San Francisco, it's not only the governor, it's the counties, it's the cities. Uh, a week and a half ago, my general counsel had 34 different shelter in place orders with different definitions of construction and essential services. It is extremely difficult, whether it's CISA or the governor or an institution defining what can go forward. We have to look at it case by case and geography by geography basis. For us as a large company, um, our, our projects are, actually reflective of your slide. Most of them, the vast majority, are still under construction and proceeding. But as owners on the call here, every owner should be asking from their contractor, from their service provider, from their vendors, to give you their COVID-19 plan. You need, as an owner, to have that for your own protection. Uh, if they haven't gotten one to you, and, and they should have automatically with this public health emergency, you should ask for it. Um, we're happy to make ours available here at Swinerton. You can just go to our website, swinerton.com, and we have a whole section on COVID-19. You're welcome to it. But one of the most important things about the COVID-19 plans, and, and Lander, you mentioned it in your comments, is it's constantly changing. And so our plan was published, I think on March 18th, and we're already planning addendums to it. Our, our plan follows CDC and WHO guidelines and recommendations, but that's changing daily, if not hourly. Um, you alluded to some of the changes. Do we wear masks or not, when we're out in public? So um, every contractor should be giving you one. The hard part, or the easier part is office work. We can work from home. We can do the social distancing. But what happens when we get on the job site? And the key is really a lot of the things you've mentioned. We've got to reduce the pinch points. So one of our best practices that we, we adopted the first thing was, unfortunately for the food truck operators, we suspended food trucks come to our job sites. Anywhere where the groups come together, you have to eliminate. You've got to stagger shifts. You've got to add to the PPE. Not only are you know the traditional hard hat, and we've actually walked away from hard hats these days. We're using helmets for safety, but gloves, masks, face shields. When social distancing is not doable, uh, we've had to increase the number of hand wash stations. We have to increase the number of toilet facilities and water coolers, um, just because part of the, the the process is drink more fluids. Um, on our larger sites, we have a dedicated COVID-19 monitor. In some cases where we're working within institutions, we do temperature checks. Um, and one of the things that has been an absolute, given the, the emergency, increased documentation of the workforce on site. Not just numbers, but unfortunately we have to have names of workers in case we have to contact the workforce in the event someone is diagnosed with COVID-19. The other comments, because I want to get to the Q&A part, is this is a reminder that this is not a temporary situation. 
while I think the, the number of shelter in place and, and the things that different jurisdictions are doing, hopefully the emergency part, the health part will subside in several weeks or a few months. The other side of it though, is the economic recovery will take much longer. What we're seeing is the markets that rely on discretionary spending are hit very hard. Airlines, travel, hospitality, retail, those projects that we had, they're all on hold or have been canceled. And in, the, in our public sector projects, some projects are being suspended or deferred because those agencies are redirecting their funds for the emergency health crisis. So as we deal with the immediacy of what's going on in our institutions and our communities, we also need to be peeking ahead 12 to 18 months because there will be um, challenges as we emerge uh, from the immediate public health situation. So those are my sort of opening comments, Lander, and I look forward to the Q&A because I want to get, get to what people really want to know and what their questions. Excellent. That's great. Thank you so much, Jeff. It really gives us a nice lay of the land, and I think that is critically important. Next, I'm going to move to uh, Sadie Greiner. She's the Director of Design and Construction at the University of Iowa. Known Sadie for a long time. She's doing great work. Sadie, we want to hear what's happening with the complexities of dealing with a main campus and a hospital, along with how um, you're speeding up projects, because I know um, that you are driving a very low occupancy uh, rate and you're creating an opportunity by doing that. So uh, you'll help us talk about that. Maybe some, uh, how you're dealing with some of the supply chain issues and the challenges with PPEs and six foot separations. I keep trying to say six degrees from Kevin Bacon, but six foot separations if you could. So Sadie, let's see what uh, what you have to tell us on some of those and then, and then we'll, um, We'll go to Q&A uh, after Steve, okay? All right, perfect. Thank you, Lander. Good morning, everybody. Thank you so much um, for having me participate in today's discussion. First, I really want to thank everyone for doing their part in helping our nation work through this challenging time, because it's just a reminder that it really does take all of us, and we all play an important part, whether or not we're in healthcare or custodial staff, contractors, or just individuals staying home. It's really in part that important that we all do our part. So I just wanna say thank you to everybody out there as well. So the first one on the complexities of managing both main campus and a hospital construction load, design and construction load. When COVID-19 measures were implemented on our campus, we had not been giving thought to how we would adopt to this type of situation. And it was only a mere three weeks ago, really, where we started to actively start to change all of our procedures. So as they talk about, you know, the daily or the hourly changes, it really is upon us in that fashion. So we were in our typical mode of working hard to complete design on a number of projects so that we would be ready to be issued for bid. And then as many of you trying to get prepared for the summer construction window that we try to hit so that we can get as much done in as short a time as possible. To give just some quick numbers about the University of Iowa and our design and construction efforts that we currently have going on campus, um, the University of Iowa is one of three state institutions. We're located in southeast Iowa in a community of a population of about 115,000, before including our students, which is an approximate another 30,000 um, individuals. And the department I uh, direct manages all the projects for the campus. So that's the main campus as well as our healthcare system. Currently today, we have approximately 120 projects in design, totaling more than $430 million. And we have $275 million on our books for capital construction, which is spread about 110 different projects and just over 50 different general contractors holding those contracts for that $275 million worth of work. So um, this breaks down, just to give you an idea, we had about 30 projects in construction in our healthcare facility and about 70 or 80 projects on the main campus with academic, athletic, rec services, and maintenance type projects going on. And it doesn't account for our smaller projects, the kind of day-to-day -day regular stuff that we do. We always have about 60 projects going on at any one time for those projects in construction. 
So when we started to ask um, what things were going to look like, we immediately went into the mode of working remotely. We had um, the public, you know, for the protection of public on campus, faculty, staff, and students. And so with that, we started to also reduce some of the entry points into our hospital specifically. Then we began testing every individual coming into our facilities, including our contractors. So we had to change the hours of the entry into the healthcare facilities for contractors so that it didn't cause added congest congestion while the healthcare workers actually were trying to get to work in the morning to do their job and during the shift um, at night. So when we made those changes, we also had to take into account material delivery for any projects that were still going to be critical to the hospital facility, as well as how we were going to manage the debris removal of those projects, while keeping into consideration all of the social separation needs and all of the protection of the people coming to and from that hospital. And just to give you a couple of other numbers, our hospital facility is one of the largest ones in the state. Um, it has over 800 beds in it. Um, and typically sees about 13,000 people on a daily basis um, with faculty, staff, and patients coming into the doors. So we changed um, all of these different procedures for that um, in a matter of a couple of um, in a matter of a couple of days. And um, we implemented this. People were very good about working through these changes with us. Um, but as Lander has mentioned, and as Jeff has mentioned, communication has been so critical and. It's been an active part of our work prior to this, but even more important to make sure people understand the changes that are happening on a daily basis. So some projects were delayed by the university. Um, while only a few projects have fallen into this category though for us, it's been less than about a dozen um, projects that we've actually delayed for some reason or another. Primarily, um, some of those have been in our utility plants for the safety because we only have a select number of operators that can um, take care and operate our plants. So we've made some decisions on that front. We've made some decisions in the healthcare facility for the needs, um, whether it be shutdowns that we can't coordinate without impacting other critical things currently going on or main operating rooms that are needed at the time. So we've delayed a few projects for those reasons as well as in our residence hall, we had a couple of projects that delayed for just a couple of weeks while we moved all the students out. But as Jeff indicated as well, we are trying to move things forward. And so one of the things um, that we have talked about is, while a lot of people are talking about which projects to stop so that the spread of COVID-19 is not continuing, we're talking about some of the opportunity with the low occupancy in some of our facilities and how we might take advantage of that to move some of our projects up. And so um, all of the buildings are on our campus are currently locked down and we have granted um, access through our card access system so that we can also monitor who's coming in and out of those facilities. So we're using that as an opportunity to allow contractors to still get in, do their work, allow maintenance work to still progress um, as needed. And then we're thinking about um, how we might schedule this so that we can complete some of that work while allowing contractors to spread out over a longer period of time. So as you think about resident hall projects and the amount of work that you typically wait until um, gra after graduation, and then you're on a mad dash to complete that work before the fall semester starts up, we are actually looking at advancing some of those projects since they're already under construction or they're already under contract and material procurement has already started, allowing some of them to get into space to spread out that work and have more social distancing for the phasing of the project. As many of us work through, you know, all of these issues, we remember, though, that we have to take into consideration um, the implementation of these new procedures and, again, make sure that we're communicating with others across all of our campuses. We, too, have a, con um, a critical incident management team that has been set up at the University of Iowa, and we're utilizing them and our set of stakeholders. We refer to it as our building coordinator um, network to make sure that we're communicating any changes so people aren't caught off guard by um, the opportunities that we might be looking at to advance projects sooner rather than later. But one of the things that I want to caution people on is that supply chain issue. 
So as some of the concerns, including supply chain, um, we want to make sure that we take that into consideration with the advancement of any of these projects due to the low occupancy opportunities that we have. We all know that prior to COVID-19, there was already concerns with labor shortages in some areas. And while we aren't necessarily experiencing that in the same way as before, we are seeing some staff reductions in our area as well, whether it be control contractors or um, fire suppression or other things, we are starting to see that some firms are not able to continue advancing their work at this time. Our largest supply chain concerns currently are with items coming overseas, however. And so whether it's specialty equipment or control valves, we are seeing a minimum of about a three week delay and in some cases an eight to 12 week delay is anticipated. And as we hear about um, PPE shortage all across the nation, we know that material shortage is going to take place for all of us as well as we advance through this time. So the question, is which part might be delayed and how will it impact your project? As we even think about speeding up some projects, we are actually reviewing the scope to try to determine if we're at risk of starting a project only to find out later that we won't be able to get all of the material we need to finish the project. So currently we are um, targeting to not impede fall classes, that's kind of our milestone that we're looking at for the University of Iowa, is making sure that we evaluate our list of projects against that. So taking in um, what our priorities are for what the exceptional um, things are that we have to keep advancing, we are also looking at a milestone of the fall semester as our target as we think through things. And so one of the things that I just um, offer out there as well is that as we currently do not have a stay at home order in the state of Iowa, we are talking about how that might impact it and how we might do things different should that be the case. But one of the things that we're just starting to talk about because of supply chain issues is what substitutions might we consider? Would we have to think of things differently? And if so, what would those substitutions potentially be in order to make sure that we can continue to have a project successful in order to use it down the road? And lastly, uh, Lander, as we talk about the PPE that is so important in the social distancing uh, to help uh, work through this crisis, it's just important to know that, you know, as we talk about six foot separation and safety procedures that have been identified on any construction project, we know that many contractors across America have dedicated individuals to assist with safety measures and they've worked diligently to, prof to promote safety practices. So whether it's eye protection, ear protection, hand protection, sometimes it takes years to try to get people to really embrace this. And with COVID-19, we've got that sense of urgency that's been deployed for PPE, and six um, foot separation minimum and then not having gatherings over a certain um, amount. And it's just really important to remember that this is something that we have to actively approach. And as just mentioned, uh, it's important to get that safety plan from the contractors that are performing work to ensure that they understand. We are not looking to take over the responsibility for the contractor safety program, but we are looking to partner with them. We have had some contractors that have asked um, for assistance in trying to procure PPE. And we are continuing to have those conversations about what the measures are that are needed to be taken, and whether it be changing the phasing of a project, whether it be changing what materials are needed on a project, or even possibly delaying or suspending the work because of safety um, concerns and making sure that safety is one of our top priorities of, for all time. So, with that, Lander, I will turn it over back over to you um, and look forward to the questions. Sadie, you really did a great job in highlighting uh, a number of the things that we are getting questions about. Um, and we are going to get to those in a second, and you've already answered some of them. So we are dutifully tracking those questions. Um, and before we get to them, I'd really like to have Steve Marashevsky. And maybe I said that right. Maybe I'm the only person, right, Steve? We call him Steve M half the time. Uh, but Steve, you have the unique vantage point of sitting on the state's emergency operations team, which is really fascinating. 
uh, maybe I call it fascinating, you might not call it the same thing, but help us understand what that means for you and tell us about the way in which you are addressing both financial impact and academic impact with respect to projects that you choose to continue and how you're categorizing or, or qualifying them as what we call essential services. Uh, because I think you have something unique going on there. Steve? Thank you. Uh, I think you changed my whole order of presentation. No, no, you can do it any order you want. I, 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 that's just for I'm me just to kidding. let people know what you're going to talk about, please. <laughs> I want to start with uh, just giving a little background because I think we're all learning. Uh, we're all at different points in this, uh, depending upon where we are in the curve, and we all have different different uh, challenges to face, depending upon how our organizations are set up. And I'm learning from those that are similar, and I'm learning from those that have that are out in front, frankly. Um, we're a little bit um, behind in Texas, and, and I don't mean that in a bad way, in a good way, in that we've had the opportunity to, it's been a little delayed, and we've had the opportunity to learn from others um, as we're approaching things. Just a little background on University of North Texas. We are multiple institutions throughout North Texas um, that have different missions and um, different bottom, basically operate on their own bottom line. So they, they operate somewhat independently, and so that's one of the challenges is how do we uh, attack things consistently um, and, and in a coordinated fashion when we're really um, part of a system that's got independent institutions. Um, so as Lander mentioned, uh, I, I have the privilege of sitting on the state emergency management um, board and that also um, has caused me to be designated as uh, sort of the coordinator of this effort among the multiple institutions, not just from facility standpoint, but from all the impacts associated with academics, finances, et cetera. Uh, that doesn't mean I'm the expert, doesn't mean I'm doing the work, it just means I'm helping to coordinate the institution. So I start my morning, um, every morning, uh, it's not how I start, but it's the first meeting of the morning at 7.30, connecting all the institutions, to talk about the challenges that have arisen since the previous day um, and then follow that uh, after uh, disseminating that information to all the uh, leadership um, follow that with a nine o'clock meeting at the system level uh, where the team talks about how we're going to address the emerging challenges that have come up from um, from the morning's meeting um, and then i end my day frankly by uh, or night um, by collating what's happening at the federal level, the state level, the city level, all of our county levels, um, so that we're prepared for the next morning meeting. Uh, so um, the mostly the point of, of that part of the conversation is that this has really outlined the need to have a really strong succession plan because many of us are performing tasks that we otherwise wouldn't have been able, been positioned to do. And if, um, I'm very fortunate. Uh, I have uh, really strong facilities folks at each of the institutions. <clears throat> I have um, competent staff who are filling in the voids that uh, of the work that I otherwise would have been doing while I'm uh, kind of sidetracked on, on these uh, other bigger issues. Um, so things that we talk about are, you know, a lot of the institutions are going past fail. What does that mean? What does that mean to academic acceptance rate in the future? Um, talk about the finances. How are we going to come out? What does this stimulus really mean? Um, how are we going to mitigate the uh, impact long term? And we talk about how we can do this together across our system. Um, and then bringing it down to the facility level, um, Texas has still uh, considered all construction to be essential. Um, pretty much. Uh, we have uh, determined our own definition of what that means. You know, we've had to kind of outline what really needs to happen. Um, and it comes down to two, two things. What is a strong economic drive, uh, pro a project that's driven from economics? Uh, what will uh, result in future student success? And then we're putting projects on hold that um, are optional and or um, to help assist us with uh, the financial challenges that we know we're going to face. So uh, making sure our cash on hand is is strong. Um, and so we have a we have a whole rubric that we're using today. But the reality is uh, our world is changing daily. Um, every morning it's a different challenge. And if I don't get emails out within an hour, they're on they're very often obsolete. Um, by the time I, I get them out because things are changing so rapidly. We've had our first two student um, cases, um, test positive tests and our first uh, staff positive tests. Fortunately, they occurred when we were uh, 
on limited staff, um, only essential services, so very little contact with anybody in the campus community, but it's early. You know, what are we gonna do when things happen next? And what are we gonna do when the supply chain starts making it next to impossible to continue effectively? Um, so we're preparing contingency plans. So last part, uh, the conversations have morphed now. What are we doing next? What are our contingency plans when, when the next big things happen? And we're starting our conversations on recovery. What's it look like when we come out of this? And are we capturing the lessons learned? And how do we improve? Uh, starting to look um, more positively toward uh, what's what the future holds. And uh, with that, I'll turn it back to Landon. That's awesome, Steve. You really did touch on a, a extremely important point around the contingency planning now. You know, we we had talked in our dry run about it's not even days anymore. It's an immediate response time, and it's um, it's actually planning not just for the next few hours, but planning short, mid, long range. Long range for us seems like the fall. I mean, that's about how how far any of us could even think. But it's that contingency planning portion that is going to be critical because we're already seeing the shortages in the supply chain that we heard from you and from Sadie. So all of these things are starting to dovetail and they're going to come back um, to haunt us and expose us in terms of what we are trying to accomplish. So uh, panel, we have some great questions coming in. Um, and I'm going to target and focus these uh, right now. So um, I'm getting a few uh, here. Uh, Sadie, I wanted you to, to think about um, how are you dealing with internal staff providing some of the services that um, would consistently be those with outside contractors? Um, and maybe all of you could chime in, but Sadie, I'm going to point to you first about um, dealing with the internal teams and staff and what you're doing in terms of treating them and their delivery similarly to that of outside contractors. Can you comment on that for us? I can. So uh, in our office, we are comprised of about 50 people altogether within design and construction. And we have all of our project support, all of our design project managers that are working remotely. And business, business continuity is extremely important and we're still moving forward with all of that. But when it comes to our construction project managers, as you might imagine, that's a position that is essential um, for the oversight and management of our projects going on. And as we continue to advance those projects, they are, we've got a mixture. We've got some people that are working out of our campus facility and we've got some people that live very close to our campus and they're actually working out of their home and coming to campus to oversee their projects and then we are utilizing a lot of different programs to make sure that we've got that business continuity understanding communication and collaboration still going on so whether or not it's different conferencing technology we also are really fortunate and um, as we talk about the benefits of efforts from the past and and what is serving us well today uh, we have an in-house project management tool that we utilize that's web-based. So all of our staff is working off of that and can see and can document because some of us have joked that, you know, this is the quickest succession planning that we've ever had to do. Um, you know, we're, we're trying to ensure that we always have one backup, um, but in some positions, as many as three people. And how would we do that? How would we get that depth? And sometimes we are talking about whether or not our construction managers would have to actually, we'd have to go to an outside firm um, to supplement our team if it got to that point, or would we just switch different positions within the office and a design project manager may have to take over um, observation for a construction project manager if they were to fall ill. Excellent. That, that answer your question? Yeah, that does, and I think that's very good. And um, maybe Steve, you or, or Jeff, you could, um, Pop in on this small project internal teams and staff. Are you seeing out there that these smaller institutions that have small project um, internal teams, are they, are you seeing them move forward? Jeff, you want to start and then I'll go to Steve. Sure, Lander. Um, it's all over the map. On the smaller institutions, some are taking the conservative route and just shutting things down 
<clears throat> others are taking the, well, you're just consultants, you guys go work, we'll stay home. Um, so it's kind of a, a diverse mix and a wide range. But similar to what Sadie said, you know, when we're out there managing projects, um, we have, particularly with projects under construction, it's usually one construction manager on site overseeing construction and they're managing their social distancing as well as we've given them cleaning protocols when they're working in shared workspaces they're not in you know a bullpen anymore it's one person in a let's say trailer by themselves but we've put in place some protocols about cleaning when they arrive cleaning when they leave uh, and then putting a, a, a checklist so that the next person because we will rotate some staff sometimes so it's not the same person all the time so there's at least a record that who was there before, like Jeff was here yesterday. I wiped down the copier, the work surface, the phone um, at five o'clock when I left. And so the next person coming in can see that. So at least there's some history and some documentation in place. One of the things that, that Sadie mentioned with the online collaboration tool, if we thought we were documenting job sites before, we have to do even more today with this public health emergency. Uh, we need to document what crafts were on site, what work was being performed, what wasn't being performed, because there are gonna be delays, whether it be supply chain, workforce, or whatever. And there are gonna be um, discussions at a point in the future about delays. And so we have to, and our daily reports have to be more detailed we have to do more documentation because what's going to happen is when those disputes emerge, we're going to have to put together an as constructed schedule and contrast that to what the baseline schedule was so that we can get to a place where we can agree and resolve disagreements. Um, so it, it is really a mixed bag and it, we have to adapt constantly to these shelter in place orders and the evolving definition of what an essential project may be. That's terrific. Steve, you want to chime in on that? Sure, I'll, I'll, I'll bounce off in a couple areas. So, so we're doing some small projects on campus utilizing people that were deemed essential um, uh, in some cases to give them uh, other things to do to fill some of the time that they otherwise wouldn't. So some of the folks we have on campus, we need them there, but we don't have full time services for them. Um, we're finding, um, in contracted work, we're finding the smaller projects actually are not running into the um, resource problems as much as the larger projects. So we're not seeing the supply chain hit the smaller projects yet. Uh, so some of those are proceeding, uh, the ones that we've deemed to be essential um, and fairly effectively. Um, from the design um, end, um, the design industry uh, has morphed really uh, quickly and easily uh, to be, they've adapted for very well to remote. Um, so we're we're proceeding pretty heavily on, on pretty much all projects related to to design um, and or planning uh, moving forward. Excellent. Uh, one last thing I was going to add, since Jeff brought it up, um, we're looking at, you know, we're on the other side of that, right? So Jeff's looking at contracts from his side. We're also looking at our side. What do we have in there in terms of our protections for these kinds of things? And we do have protections in our contracts related to states of emergency. Um, but you know, this is a this is a, a new thing. I think we're going to find all kinds of legal issues when this is all said and done. How they're going to be applied. We're, but we're we're starting to look at what are where are our vulnerabilities, you know, or where are our exposures, I should say. And so, Jeff, can I track back to you? That's really good because it prompted me to think about um, something that people are asking here and that we have all discussed, and it's the bigger issue um, of when the work gears back up um, and we come into recovery, firms out of business due to cash flow challenges. Can you, uh, can you talk to us about that bigger issue? And you had mentioned um, at one point about subcontractors. Sure. Um, as I mentioned earlier, I mean, it is great to see a movement in Washington with these stimulus packages. The challenge is going to be for businesses, how much cash goes to them and how they might recover if they recover. And, and that's a big if. 
you know, I, I've often talked about at the um, Institute, um, you know, cash is king, and it really is going to be a big issue right now, as both Sadie and Steve mentioned. Uh, cash conservation is, is a big deal for the next, I would say, three to six months. And those firms that don't have cash are going to struggle immensely. Uh, the stimulus bills in the private sector, there's not going to be a lot of cash going to uh, companies. What the government's probably going to do is they're going to offer tax credits, which means the private companies will have to find cash on their own and they'll get the cash back in the next year in terms of their tax returns in the form of tax credits. And so in our business, uh, what we are doing is we're looking very, very carefully at contractors and subcontractors. And the important barometer that we're seeing is what we call the debt equity ratio. Before the public health emergency hit, there were firms that were close to one to one. They had as much equity as they had debt, which means anything prolonged with a shelter in place or having projects shut down is going to create cash flow challenges for these firms and they may not they may not make it out the back end so what you need to really be concerned about is making sure payment performance bonds are up to date in place and if you haven't gone out to bid and you are able to pre-qualify take a hard look at that debt equity ratio because those firms are going to be extremely challenged in the next three to six months from a cash flow standpoint Jeff, that is really excellent advice. Um, I'm so happy that you are on this panel and giving us that perspective. Um, it, it's critical. And you know, I, I know we have um, we had a question about plan the plans for responding to delay claims. I think Steve, you and Jeff talked about it in terms of time and money or both. But also, you had mentioned, and please correct me if I'm wrong, but keeping track of delay costs in case the federal government provides um, monies for those, uh, or you have to, you know, through FEMA, et cetera. Um, could, you, could you tell um, our audience a little bit more about that so that they are already ahead of the game? Because that is a, that's something you should be planning for, am I right? So Jeff, you wanna go there and, and then- sure, I'll start, then I'll pass to Steve. Okay. Um, what we did here, uh, we started with our COVID-19 task force. Um, I mean, that was just, we had to do that. It was upon us in a heartbeat. Um, but we also added a second task force and it is a COVID-19 financial recovery task force. Um, as I alluded to previously, you know, we're not expecting cash from the government to help us come out of this. We're expecting tax credits or some other form of you pay it because we don't have the money, but we'll give you a break on your tax returns next year. To be able to do that though, you need to document the impacts, the financial impacts that were actually occurred. And so we have put in place uh, phase codes or cost codes to track if I've got people um, on overhead because a project shut down, I've got supply chain issues, people can't work. We have a special code that we are tracking the financial impacts due to COVID-19. And so this task force is then going to compile um, on a regular basis, on a weekly, if not monthly basis, the cost of the impacts so that in the event there are recovery programs and we don't have any idea what they're going to be, but we are going to be able to calculate and document and give an audit trail about what those financial impacts are so that we can at least try to pursue recovery wherever those opportunities are. Wonderful. Steve, did you want to add to that? Yeah, I'll talk to it on the other side of the coin. So Jeff's doing this stuff uh, from his, from a, a contractor standpoint, you know, what are the things that they can recover? We're at the end of this, we're going to end up with some compensable uh, delay, whatever, you know, somewhere there's going to be something that's compensable. So we're also uh, keeping track of that. Uh, on our side of the equation, you know, what are startup restart costs, you know, shutdown costs, those kinds of things that may be compensable at the end of the day, um, but otherwise wouldn't have been spent on projects. So we're going to account for that as well. And then our day-to-day -day operations, the benefit 
you know, we were kind of joking about being part of the state emergency management council. The benefit is um, our, our information as an institution now goes into the FEMA system immediately. You know, we're, um, we, we upload, we're uploading, I don't know if it started yet, but we'll be uploading daily uh, financial impacts to the institution. Terrific. I want to, I want to Joe, one little step is sort of an angle here because somebody asked a really good question about what about those projects that were planned to be financed via bond sales and how might the bond market impact capital development? That was one really popped out at me. I don't know if we as a panel can respond, but Jeff, I'll, I'll ask you if you know um, anything about that or and, and anybody on the panel because that that one really popped out is a very interesting question that one is a great question and, and I can only give a comment from about 30,000 feet as we saw with the Fed policy um, they reduced um, you know the cost of borrowing almost to zero um, so it is, in some ways, a great time to borrow money. Um, so let me back up for a second, because I do a lot of things other than work here at Swinerton. So having been a former elected official and things like that, um, I understand government borrowing and, and refinancing. And so if there's a bond issuance that has already been issued, there's the opportunity to refinance at a lower interest saving um, their voters and the community interest costs. Um, we are looking at one of my agencies that I sit on the board, um, refinancing $500 million of bonds at a much lower interest rate and recapitalizing you know, the funds to repurpose them for other things. So at a high level, it's a great time to borrow money because of the cost of, of borrowing. It's a great time to refinance because the, the cost of borrowing is, is almost zero. But the other side of it is that there is going to be a challenge because you gotta pay it back at some point in time. And that's why I mentioned earlier in my comments, we gotta look around the corner and peek ahead about how we are going to be spending future funds, whether it's on public health, economic recovery, or bondholders. Terrific. Others? Either, and it's okay, you can pass. You know no, what I'll, I'll, I'll add a little bit. So the, uh, that market is actually impacting some of our decisions. Uh, you know, we, we uh, do some of our short-term stuff with commercial paper and the commercial paper market has been really squirrely. So, you know, we're, we're analyzing every one of our projects and the associated funding sources as to whether we have better options and or should, um, refinance in a different way. Got it. That's excellent. Now I'm going to go to Sadie. Sadie, we got some interesting stuff coming at us um, that that I think you can help us. And that was on supply chain. If you knew and you know it, that certain materials or equipment face long lead times, are you actually adding longer lead times and planning out those projects accordingly? I mean, sort of, it's really an interesting question to me. Um, what do you think about that? Yeah, Landa, that's a great, um, great question to be asking. And yes, we are. We are actually seeing that things that already had long lead items on them are growing um, because some manufacturers are shutting down um, because of the stay at home order. And so we are, um, we're contacting a lot of different manufacturers. We're actually hearing from them. Some of them have been really proactive um, in informing us, but we are in a lot of situations evaluating every project and having to dig back into it with the material and the procurement of it um, because we are seeing anywhere from the three weeks to as much as eight weeks being added onto whatever you had previously thought you were going to get that material and what timeline that was going to be. That's, an, that's excellent advice. And, and Sadie, I wanna do a, a couple of others here because I think you've um, got a really good vantage point on um, who's determining when a building is closed at Iowa? What, what, what are you seeing? So our construction um, institute, our um, incident management team is the one that has been working through that. They've been working with our public safety and our operations and maintenance team, and then also the deans to talk about what the impact is, because obviously we have online learning that is still taking place. 
there are some classrooms and some offices that people need to still get into in order to do their online classes. Um, but that went through our, our central um, incident management team for final decision making. Excellent. Steve, you find the same thing through your emergency operations team or what? Um, yeah, pretty much. We're, um, uh, you know, it's it's mostly uh, decided uh, back uh, based on academics and things are, we're pretty much shut down everywhere with some very small um, operations around on-campus housing. We have uh, residents that have no alternative, so we're maintaining a campus population to serve them. We are also starting to offer some of our facilities for first responders, um, so we may have uh, first responders using one of our residence halls in the near future and also serving them while they're in need of housing. Okay, that's, um, boy, that ties perfectly um, to another one that someone asked about. Um, so maybe you can dovetail off of that and I'll go to Sadie. And that is, are we using facilities for patients yet? Uh, you just told me that you're using them for first responders for um, students that can't go home, maybe it's even international as housing, um, but are you using them for patients not infected with COVID? And may maybe that's uh, best. Uh, I don't know if you are, Stephen, that state of Texas, but. We are not. Um, however, um, as being part of the state emergency management group, we're constantly identifying to them what we could do if called upon. So if called upon, we're identifying the vehicles we have, the space we have, storage space for medical supplies, things like that. So we, we're constantly providing them updates on our inventory of what could be used if, it, if things turned really bad. Okay, got it. And Sadie, um, you're, you're right there with we're the here. main things in a hospital. So what's happening there? Um, currently, I'm happy to say that we haven't had that need uh, to start looking at others. We, we are identifying it, just as Steve indicated. Um, but for the most part, all of our space issues have been trying to make sure that those that are essential for still staying on campus and more in office capacities have enough social distancing. So we've opened up some facilities for other places for different um, departments to move into that have to stay on campus because they are essential. But other than that, we have not um, had to create any other healthcare um, space outside of our hospital facilities. Okay, good. And both of you, have you refunded room and board of any, uh, of, of any, to any degree that you're aware of in Texas or Iowa? I refuse we to answer that. We have in Iowa. I refuse no. to answer that question on the grounds uh, that I, We're looking at multiple, <laughs> um, we're looking at credits and versus refunds. And uh, dip, we have, as I said, we have different institutions who can operate independently. So we may have different uh, approaches depending upon which institution it is. Okay. But yes, we are looking. Looking at it, okay, depends. All right, at least he said he's looking at it. Sadie? Um, at Iowa, we have not um, refunded tuition um, specifically, but we do have some other things. We have room and board, and then there are some other criteria that um, we're looking at refunding, but not for the most part, the tuition. Okay, very good. I had a question about um, setting up command centers. Um, and any of one of you can dive in here, but I think you're on a command center, Steve. And my understanding is if you don't have one, you need one. And you need an emergency operations team. You need an incident management team. Maybe uh, back to what Don Gookert and Mary Vosovich had said, along with uh, Norm Young. Now, the first one is they are following NIMS, uh, the National Incident Management System. So the answer is yes. Anybody want to add to that, Steve? Um, yeah, absolutely. You you need one. Um, we have we actually have a really robust one at one of our campuses that um, is way out in front, and uh, we utilize their services a lot across all all the other locations. Um, we do not follow NIM, the NIMS uh, necessarily. You know, basic principles of NIMS, but not the letter of, NIM, of NIMS, but very similar uh, in its function. Okay. Good. All right, Jeff, I'm gonna ask you this one. Um, do, do you foresee or are you seeing um, construction costs would drop significantly that institutions should get projects shovel ready? This is sort of around the bidding uh, and it's sort of an interesting angle that I wanted to attack because the person had asked it. Yeah, no, I, I would encourage um, institutions to get projects shovel ready. Um, 
with the shelter in place orders of various sorts, I, I can say one thing that is on contractors' mind and on subcontractors' minds right now. They're looking for backlog. Um, with markets, like I said earlier, particularly those relying on discretionary spending, they're not going to come back very quickly. Uh, I'll give a great example. Um, we have a team working at the Hotel Del Coronado. The Hotel Del Coronado just shut down the entire hotel for 30 days, the first time in their 130-year history. Wow. That project won't restart very quickly, even when we come out the backside. So the contractors working on that project are, are going to go, what are I going to put my guys and gals on? I have another business colleague who runs a mechanical subcontracting firm. He just laid off 500 people. Now's the time, and particularly if you have a design build project, because I think Steve mentioned it earlier, now's a great time to go to market, particularly on design build projects where you're gonna have a design phase earlier because that design phase can happen virtually. And then, you know, that takes time to get that design confirmed, permitted, things like that. And then you can hit construction later. So I am current, we have several projects going to market right now um, and I will know in a matter of two to three weeks how the results are. But in talking to industry colleagues and contractors and subcontractors, they are extremely worried about backlog. So going to market now, uh, I think you'll get sharp pencils and hopefully good results. Got it. Okay, that's good. Um, I had a question here that might tie to that. It said, what about bond expenditure requirements over three years for ongoing projects? Impacted any kind of relief uh, on the time? What do, you, what, uh, what do you think? Maybe you and Steve could chime in on that. Jeff, you wanna? We haven't about? seen any movement on that yet. Um, okay. I, think, I think everybody's waiting to see at this moment on the bonding mm -hmm. side of the business. Uh -huh. uh, but I can follow up if you would shoot me that question or the team can shoot me that question. I can check with our bonding uh, folks and see if there's any impact on what the, the current thinking is. That would be great. Okay. Um, so, Sadie, I have a specific question about Iowa's decisions. Um, since you're not in a stay-at-home uh, shelter state yet, um, how are you deciding what is essential? And you, you talked a little bit in the beginning about how you're dealing with and the struggle that you have with six feet separations and that you're really having to press implementation and forcing that with contractors. But could you give just a little more detail? Because somebody is trying to understand from the perspective of flattening the curve, how are you making the call on what really should count as, a, as an essential construction project? I think it's a good question. What are you thinking? Yeah. Yeah, so um, our decision making to date has been that because we have our campus is so barren that we are able to abide by the six foot separation and still keep projects moving forward in a safe manner. And we still have contractors that have put the COVID-19 safety plans into place and they are asking to keep moving forward with their projects. So that has been one thing, but we are in the process of, you know, looking at a couple of other um, ideas on how to rate our projects or how to categorize them. And one is, does it support hospital business continuity? Because that's really important at this time. One is infrastructures. Does it support infrastructure business continuity, whether that be utility systems, whether that be roof, you know, and maintenance type or projects. One is critical research. Um, we have a pharmaceutical production plant on our campus. And so, you know, they are actively have been doing hand sanitizer and other important um, medicine for response to this. And so keeping critical research on campus moving forward. And then the last two um, that we're kind of using right now is does it, uh, the project support fall semester starting and does it support the economy i think all of us have kind of talked about these different categories we're just using this as kind of a benchmark to further dissect the projects and answer all those other questions where does the six foot separation come in and what concerns are um, what are the material supply issues what are the safety issues um, for all of the employees and on campus and what's the coordination that we have to do? So those are just some of the categorization that we're using at Iowa to try to 
um, facilitate the communication on which projects should move forward and which ones maybe we should not. Oh, that's great. Okay, so um, Steve, I want to ask you to chime in because you have a, uh, that definition of essential services. Maybe you could say that again so people get what yeah, you're can, doing and not, okay? Okay, I can I can tell you what it is today. Um, and uh, <laughs> subject to more discussion actually we're, we're talking about it a little bit with our border regions next week so it'll probably change we are fortunate in that all of our counties um, that our institutions are in have the same or consistent stay at home work orders and um, the fact that they you know essential services includes well i know they, they include construction under essential services. So I don't have, you know, some of the other institutions in Texas cross municipalities that may have multiple requirements. We, we don't. Ours are pretty much aligned, so we're really, really lucky. So we've defined essential services um, for projects as being uh, those that are uh, significant for future institutional success, either, either financial or academic. Uh, either current or future health and well-being, you know, uh, significant for the health and well-being of the occupants and uh, or essential for protection of the physical assets. So those are the categories that we're calling essential. Work that's being delayed or canceled, um, they are falling in the other categories. Um, if they're not included in any one of those three, for instance, um, they are not essential. Um, there, can, there are projects that may be considered essential otherwise, but they have timing flexibility, um, so that allows us to stall, um, and that helps short-term finance issues, and or their value and timing is questionable depending upon the impacts of the long or the long-range impacts of the pandemic. We're going to come out of this di looking differently. So, are there projects that? Gee, I don't know. If, you know, if we look differently, do these make sense? Um, so we put some in that category that we're putting on hold. That's, well, that's I think that's great. Go ahead, keep going. That's it. Th th those are the those are categories. Okay, very good. That's perfect. So um, I'm gonna uh, drag all of you into a, a, a one around. Ah, uh, this is hard. Our campus is going to redirect funds. The existing money they have have spending freezes in the coming months. Um, you know, nobody knows the answer to this, but you also have some sense of the impact on university operating budgets and the like, because we had lots of questions around this um, redirecting funds. We had this for this. Is it getting pulled? Is it getting frozen right now? Could you all give me a sense of that? I'll start with Sadie, go to Steve, and then Jeff. Sadie, what do you think? So, Lander, I don't have the answers on this one. I think it's um, something that we're all facing, and I think it's something that we know is coming. We um, have had conversations about the financial impact of, you know, shutting down the campus, like we have had to, what it's done to housing and dining budget, what it has done to our athletic department budget. Um, some of those conversations are taking place outside of design and construction, um, and we know that we're going to be impacted. We are just trying to offer the best information that we can back to the CIMP team, as well as um, other administrators and deans so that they can make their decisions as they face their budget challenges moving forward. Okay, good. Steve, any thoughts? Um, you can pass. No, I can, <laughs> I'll tell you, no, I gotta, I gotta be careful I only share what we've already shared, um, you know, cause these are the conversations that happen uh, all the time we're doing contingency planning you know looking at what the finances may or may not look like you know when we come back in the fall um our um our enrollments impacted you know so you have a whole range of things that could happen you know that based on you know how this ends up uh, we know that there are going to be significant financial impacts so immediately we're you know we're, we're being wise with the money we have on hand we're reducing our spending everywhere we can we're um you know soft and hard hiring freezes in some cases, rethinking on how personnel can be, existing personnel can be, you know, all the things that you would normally do um, in a budget crunch. Um, so we're looking at all of those things. We don't have any firm decisions yet um, because we don't know what the impact's going to be or what the impact of the federal stimulus will be. At the moment, it looks like, you know, what's currently on the table, it's, it's a fraction of what the cost will be. So we're gonna be faced with having to answer these questions in the future. How's that for a political response? 
Yeah, you're on that state team for a reason, aren't you? <laughs> okay, Jeff, any you want to add or or pass? Oh, Please. I I I think I think everyone has said. I think it's been consistent between the the first uh, town hall meeting with Don and Mary and 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 this is that the economic impacts are, are unknown. Uh, but I think what is known is there is going to be financial needs as we come out the other side of this. And mm -hmm. I said, I think in my comments, cash is going to be even bigger king mm -hmm. uh, as we go forward. And, and as much as people may not want to hear it, I think um, I think the question was about redirecting funds or yeah. spending freezes. I think they're all tools in the toolkit, depending on what it looks like coming out the other side, as well as everything else, um, because of the magnitude of what is happening. And I don't know, I don't think any of us here on this webinar knows exactly when this is gonna be in. I wish I was good enough to say this is gonna be over on April, whatever. I think we just have to re ride this, adapt to it, and. and Sadly to say, all tools have to be in the toolkit to be able to help all of us respond to whatever it looks like going forward. And so we need to be thoughtful. We shouldn't be putting any tools in the closet. They need to be all available because uh, we may need many of them. Agreed. So we have a, a good question here that said, are there uh, emerging practices regarding communication and information gathering when contractors um, uh, with contractors regarding supply chain and labor forces. I mean, are you having that um, back and forth with them? Um, the one, the person identifies that they have a hundred plus active projects and it can be difficult to aggregate that information. Um, any thoughts on that? Any one of you? So I can take, um, yeah. just to let everybody know what we're doing at the University of Iowa. Uh, as I mentioned, we've got our project management tool, but one of the things that we're using is a group account for my department and a SharePoint site so that we can put a spreadsheet out there and everybody as they talk with the contractors can update that information as to what manufacturer has sent us information, what of their material is being delayed, how long, and those type of things. And then we also are talking about having um, a conference call type of situation with the general contractor so that we can hopefully get that information. And then as you know, you all continue to point out, share that information across all of our um, organization so that we all know what the impact is that we're facing. Okay, good. Any others want to chime in on that one? Well, I, I don't really Go think that. My, my staff is looking at some of that, but um, we don't have the volume that you're talking about right now. We're, we're, we're sort of fortunate. A lot of our major projects were on the backside, so um, okay. one thing to be happy about. Okay, yeah. I like one thing to be happy about. That's a good thing. Now I'm gonna I'm gonna attack one that has to do with carbon reduction goals, and that is many campuses had carbon reduction goals. Where are you seeing these fall out? Do you think those funds would get redirected? You don't have to deal with the last part of it, but what is happening with the carbon reduction goals and the plans that you had in place? And this ties to the sustainability. Um, stuff as well, and I, I think it's important for us to discuss. Jeff, can you talk about that from a, a larger, from the outside looking in, and then maybe um, Sadie and Steve can give us a sense some from their institutions and state? Well, I'll, I'll talk about it, the big picture view mm -hmm. across our, you know, I have 60 staff spread across California and six offices, and a lot of people are working from home or sheltering in place. Um, at this point in time, with so many people not working on campus um, or on their job sites or their agencies, um, that has far, um, has done more to achieve um, carbon neutral and greenhouse gas re emission reductions than anything we could have done as a contractor or a builder. Um, in this building where we usually have three to 500 people, there's two people here today. Um, and so I think the anecdotal um, is that with students working or taking classes online, um, faculty teaching online, 
um, staff working from home, at least for the moment, greenhouse gas emissions um, have gone down significantly. Similar to what Steve alluded to earlier though about design projects, we do see those institutions that are working on their plans still going forward. I have an assignment right now to put together our carbon neutral plant for a university. That planning work is still going forward. So it's a great time to plan, um, but you know, as to work, construction work is still going on, but with regard to GHG, just because of so much sheltering in place, um, it, it's amazing to see um, clean water, rivers, clean air to sort of naturally happen because people aren't driving as much. Mm, that's a really good point. Yeah. Others you want to want to uh, say anything about that one? I, I am not aware of any measures that have been stopped at the University of Iowa. Um, we do have a, a unique situation. We just had a financial close March 10th um, for a public-private partnership with a firm to take over the operation of our utility system. And so that um, mixed in with all of this, uh, we are, you know, in the beginning steps of, you know, now recreating those processes and, and procedures for working between our, our two teams as one. Got it. Okay, good. I'm going to um, ask you one. Well, let me ask because we have... Um, we have a few more minutes, and and what I want to do is ask you specific about ongoing research activities and EHS waste removal and disposal. Um, what do you have procedures uh, related to those? I know that in one case, the vice president for research at University of Kentucky actually makes the decisions about research um, and what's going to be a research activity or not. Um, so I I know about that. I don't know how you're handling that. Maybe at Iowa, Sadie, but also that whole EHS waste removal and disposable piece? So at Iowa, um, we are. Um, so they have been going through the definition of, of what that essential research is, and they've been working through that, through that organization. Um, the environmental health and safety, we have a small team within my department that takes care of asbestos abatement and air monitoring, uh, and that's continuing to um, be a daily operation. The rest of environmental health um, and safety, as I understand it, is still um, a daily operation as well, but it's cut back because our work has cut back so much on campus. Um, and so they're just having to be coordinated to make sure that we are abiding by all the COVID-19 safety measures. Got it. Okay, good. I, I want to um, open up this Pandora's box. I'm going to do it anyway. Um, now, I know that uh, we've discussed social distancing measures, and we I want to remind everybody on the call that we have an incredible number of survey responses um, around um, that particular, um, that, that kind of topic through staggering shifts and, and such. So that might be a good place to go, and I know that each one of you has talked about that in terms of how you're um addressing it so i wanted to just address it that way uh, but this sort of uh, it, it's getting close to my last question um given time is i want to talk about tying together the online delivery that everyone's doing right now academically versus the physical space needs in the future now i know i'm really opening it up for a a, a nightmare conversation but maybe we can talk about the impact on future construction renovation and renovation activities. Um, Steve, you talked about tying together everything based on student success, the academic need, um, and that's how you're aligning financial impact to academic impact. But this is becoming very real. Someone said to me um, not that long ago, what if we do this and we do it really well and then we don't need these campuses anymore? Now, I think that's pretty outrageous. However, there is going to come out the other end, this thought, and we're all contingency planning for fall to open, but what if? So um, could all three of you um, sort of have a conversation about that um, with our folks before we wrap up? And Steve, I'm going to start with you. Oh, sure. Thanks. You just keep trying to get me in here. <laughs> the, um, 
Um, so we're having those conversations. So what does it look like? I don't think any of us can guess, right? Um, you know, it seemed to me that when online sort of took off, um, so did in-person education. So it was more and more and not more, not one replacing the other. So I don't know what it's going to look like, but we are discussing things from that standpoint as we all get really good at this. Does that mean we have more students in the future and you know the resident population returns or a large segment does and we have more online? I, I don't know. I, I mean, it's kind of a, a silver bullet I think we're all going to be struggling with. Um, you know, my personal feeling is uh, there's still a huge demand for in-person in education. And, um, you know, and I'm still hearing the feedback while online is successful and we're successfully making this transition rapidly. I, I don't think the uh, the feedback isn't necessarily that everybody is embracing it as much as they did the resident. Got it. Um, Good. Mission. Good. Excellent. Say, do you want to pass? Or I want to tackle that. A little bit? I, I would agree. I would agree with what Steve said. Um, you know, I, I think there's a lot of stuff that we did within um, the University of Iowa to actually be in a, a as good a position as we are to work remotely um you know so that it was fairly seamless in some ways and yet um as a, from a personal note uh, i've got two children that are in college and they're now at home taking these and and i would say that i would love to see them back in the classroom <laughs> <laughs> yeah i think everybody on the call who has that would probably agree with you um and maybe they would that kids would agree with that as well we are seeing some emerging changes in attitudes and what that may mean when um students decide you know am i going to go back uh what am i going to do jeff you want to you you want to tag team that at all sure i i'm going to wear a different hat because lana one of the things i don't tell everybody about is i'm also a trustee for a private university here in the bay area hmm. and so wearing a trustee hat um, i would echo what what Steve and Sadie shared is that there is a place for online learning um, at this university I am involved with. We have been doing online learning uh, for several years, but it will not replace the social interaction and the face-to-face -face and the group. I mean, there's just, you just cannot have as rich a learning experience by just relying on online. I think we'll see more of it for some courses, but we will still need that group interaction and that face to face and that that's the social aspect of learning um and i don't see that going away well i don't either and none of us know how that's gonna you know that it, it's uh we know the why i think we know the why we we're talking about the why and um you know it's just uh what are we going to have available to us and Correct. how will we go about it right am Correct. i right with that? yeah Okay. Lander, Lander, I want to chip yeah. in group. I know we're at the end of our time, but I want to talk okay. for a couple more things. Yes, please. We haven't talked about. One is inspections of construction. And I think we talked about it a little bit about the technology tools. We're learning on our project sites that we are having to use our virtual tools with some of our inspectors, the building officials, you know, construction inspectors, whatever whether it be you know, showing them videos or FaceTime or whatever, if they don't want to come to the project site, we have to kind of bring the project site to them virtually. So we are walking around with cameras and recorders and virtual devices to get the inspector online so they can approve construction as we go and not have them hold up projects. Uh, we haven't found the right tool. I don't think there is any one answer to it all but we have to experiment with that building official to get the right tool and what they need to say, yes, you did it right. The last thing I wanna offer, and you talked about it, Lander, in your opening comments is communication. One, with so many people working from home or working remotely, we've gotta stay in touch with them. And so I have implemented with my organization a daily check-in. I need to know where they're at and I need to know personally that they're okay. Uh, when you come to the work site or an office, if someone doesn't show up for two days, you kind of know they're not there. You can't rely on them on email that they're okay. And so I do a daily check-in. 
And with my staff, I equate it to like chasing somebody for their time card, except we're doing it every day. And so one of the fun things we've done is that if you check in on time for a week, we have a prize for the week. Your name goes in a hat and it may be a gift certificate to DoorDash or a Kindle or something you can do while you're at home just to add some fun to it. And then I do a, a evening update to my entire organization every weeknight to just stay in touch with them and let them know what's going on. It's important to keep them tied in, keep them, you know, keep the communication channels open um, and be available to them. That's excellent. I appreciate it. Thank you so much, panel. Uh, I want to go to the slide uh, about resources that I have available. Please check in on all of those resources. We have those survey links now that I mentioned earlier. We want to make sure that you have them. Um, and then uh, this will all be sent out to uh, and made available. And it's all there. Secondly, let's go to the other slide about the impact of COVID-19 on human resources. It's all about the people, folks. Um, it's all about the people um, because that's who gets it all done. Uh, so what I also want to do in my closing comment is um, tell you that social distancing is a big deal. Fauci said that the virus determines the timetable, not us. It's all about our behaviors. There's no magic bullet, no treatment, no cure. And so there was a great Toni Morrison quote that I'm going to paraphrase in alignment with facilities professionals. And uh, it was this, this is precisely the time when artists, that's how it was, but I'm gonna say facilities professionals go to work. There is no time for despair, no place for self-pity, no need for silence, no room for fear. We roll up our sleeves, we go to work. This is how we help our communities heal. So I want you, as I close out, find the good in every day. Make one incredible memory for yourself and one incredible memory, memory for another person every day. Thank you. You've all been fantastic. We appreciate you and we'll see you next week.